with another edition of the Overflow, man, in which we are looking to free people from impotent forms, all various forms of impotent Christianity. It is not grounded in love, grounded in power, grounded in what happens when we allow the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to go first in our lives and we learn how to live in the overflow. Life in the overflow is just radically, completely different uh, than any other way of life offered on planet Earth. There's so much vitality. There's so much available for us, but we've got to learn how to do it. One of the most nefarious places that we have come across, that I've come across in all the years of doing ministry and, and meeting with people, is a place that we've come to call the Tortured Middle. Tortured Middle is populated by followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that on the one hand will not reject Jesus at all, but on the other hand are not living his abundant life. They don't, they don't understand it. They've given up on it. Hey, what I've got is the best I'm going to get. Or I'm just trapped in some place that doesn't feel like I can get out of. And we have come to describe the totality of those people as the tortured middle. What we've been doing now in this mini-series, if you will, in, in Overflow, is examining various pockets within the larger tortured middle uh, we've uh, we're identifying i think six of these it might expand but right now i think we've got six identified the last time that we were together the last overflow session that i did we talked about the courtroom today we're going to talk about the hospital bed the hospital bed can be an absolutely it can easily be another trap in which christians can be bound in the tortured middle whereas the courtroom will lure you through guilt and shame the hospital bed will seduce you, will pin you down through trauma and triggers. Trauma and triggers. These two words seem to have exploded in popular use. Counselors today can even become quote unquote trauma certified, which I don't get at all. I don't, I don't get that. Most people seek professional counseling because of some pain they've experienced from others. Pain causes trauma. My point of confusion is that aren't all professional counselors trained to deal with trauma? If, if you're going to a counselor who's not trauma, who's not been trained to deal with trauma, what exactly are they doing? I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, and then as one, myself, who sat in people's pain, their trauma, their darkness, whatever word you want to call it, for 25 years, the buzziness of trauma and triggers has been interesting to watch. The the buzziness of invoking trauma, the word trauma and the word triggers has just ballooned, just ballooned past 15 years or so. And as a phenomenon, it's been certainly uh, it's been pretty interesting to watch. Now, trauma and triggers are absolutely real. Of course, they're real. They can be great describers of portions of people's stories, but, but they can also easily transition into becoming handcuffs. They can become handcuffs. The hospital bed can become permanent. So how does that happen? This is how it happens. The permanency of the hospital bed happens when one believes, any person believes that their wounds, what's been done to them, are too deep and too wide for our Father to heal and overcome. When our, when our trauma gets to be bigger than God's providence, then, then we are permanently handcuffed uh, to, the, uh, to the hospital bed so that instead of a son or daughter of our father having been victimized by another or by others, the person now identifies as a victim. Everything is about trauma. Trauma must be meticulously dissected in every way, shape, form, or fashion. Everything that happens in a person's life is now connected to a past injury or, a, or past injuries. Uh, unbeknownst to the one on the hospital bed, oftentimes unbeknownst to the one on the hospital bed, their trauma has now become an idol. Ooh, man, this is tough. You can actually make an idol out of your trauma. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like this. Identifying idolatry is the simple, it's a simple exercise of determining who or what has the most power in one's life. Whatever has the most power in your life, that is what's number one in your life. And if what's number one in your life is anything but God, that is idolatry. So, for example, I can idolize my wife if her words about me have more power than Jesus' words. If I'm more concerned about pleasing my wife than I am than pleasing my father, that's idolatry. 
I idolatry I idol I idolize my job if my company's agenda dic dictates my life's schedule. I idolize money if my worth is connected to my bank account. And I idolize my trauma if the pain that another has caused me has greater force in my life than the love and comfort and calling of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hopefully it's easy to see now how it's possible for trauma to become idolatry. In the Bible, my go-to guy, one of my go-to guys uh, for one who has suffered intensely is Joseph. For a person who has, man, just been in the war of life in, in crazy ways, in dark ways, and walk through it is Joseph. He never, he's fascinating because he, and all the suffering that he endured, and he endured some heavy suffering, he never allowed his suffering to handcuff him to a hospital bed. He never, never, never did. His whole story, Joseph's whole story is found in Genesis chapter 30, Genesis chapter 30, verse 22, through Genesis chapter 50, verse 26. But we're not going to read through all that. It's going to take a long time. Consider these highlights from Joseph's life. The, the first piece of trauma that Joseph experiences, which is often overlooked, is that his mom, Rachel, died when Joseph was really, really, really young. Rachel was giving birth to Joseph's two twin brothers, uh, and uh, excuse me, to Joseph's brother, Benjamin, and she died in childbirth. Joseph would have been a little, little boy, maybe three, four, five years old, something like that, and his mom died extremely traumatic absolutely extremely traumatic uh, then his brothers famously sold him into slavery to the Midianites who then sold him to the Egyptians you can read that portion of his story Genesis 37 18 to 36 and in that that the portion of that story you really need to see the moment where Joseph realized that his brothers were not going to rescue him and he began to feel the weight of his loneliness and the uncertainty of his future unbelievably unbelievable traumatic tra trauma unbelievable that family members would sell another family member into slavery and then we didn't even pick this up in the blog but then the, the older brothers go and lie to the dad i mean a complete erasure from life joseph was completely erased from life by his brothers horrific mom died brothers have erased him unbelievable that'd be enough that'd be enough but no no there's more Joseph sold by the Midianites to the Egyptians uh, within, uh, as, a, as a slave in Egypt. He, he ends up in the house of a guy named Potiphar. Uh, while in, in, the house, in, in Potiphar's house, Joseph is falsely accused of rape. Potiphar's wife claims that Joseph raped her, lying about it. Consequently, he's put in jail after, watch this, He's put in jail even though he's morally pure. Joseph is morally pure, gets put in jail, and he's wildly successful in the workplace. Joseph is an incredible employee, and for all of his labor, he gets wrongly accused of rape and put in jail. Enough trauma? Is that enough trauma? Is that enough pain? After rightly interpreting the dream of a fellow prisoner, that prisoner gets released. That prisoner gets released from jail promises not to forget about Joseph and what does he do he gets released and he forgets about Joseph consequently Joseph remains in prison for two more years two more years the trauma in Joseph's life can you imagine the psychological condition Joseph could have been in had he given into his trauma how easily could he connect everything in his adult life to his childhood how many triggers Joseph would have had? Now, let me ask you this. This is crazy. Now, I think it's crazy. How would a contemporary, 2024, how would a certified trauma counselor who is not skilled in the much weightier reality of the providence of God guide Joseph through his pain? What, what could they offer? Was Joseph's pain real? Was it, was, excuse me, was, was Joseph's trauma real? Yes. Did his trauma cause him pain? Uh, yes. 
Did it significantly affect the direction of Joseph's life? Absolutely. Did Joseph's trauma define his life? No, it did not. Was Joseph's trauma bigger than God's ability to heal him and make his life fruitful? Absolutely not. He, he, he suffered immensely, immensely. I, I've listened to unbelievably dark family of origin stories. I have heard of horrors that family members have done to other family members. And I'm not ranking these as Joseph's is worse than anybody else's. All I'm saying is that in the, in the, uh, in the catalog of suffering in a person's life, Joseph has been through some stuff. You cannot deny the degree to which Joseph has endured grotesque things in his life, horrible things in his life. Yet, yet, Joseph never identified himself as a victim. Joseph never saw his pain as something greater than the Lord's providence. Watch this. At the end of that two-year prison term where Joseph was forgotten and left, Joseph was released. He gets released from prison. And he's made the number two official in all of Egypt. Watch how this, watch how this comes out. Watch how this turns out in his life. Joseph oversees all of Pharaoh's operations. He marries a woman named Asenath, Asenath, and he has two sons. Watch, watch how this works. Watch Joseph's secret. Watch the power of God's restorative ability. And you can read these verses. Genesis 41, 50 to 52. Genesis 41, 50 to 52. This is what scripture says. Now, before the year of the famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. Watch this. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh for, Joseph said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. He named his second son Ephraim, for Joseph said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. I mean, wow. Come on, man. Look at this. Joseph never forgot his story. He never forgot his story. He carried with him the reality of what his brothers did to him, but their actions did not define him. He did not get trapped in pity or victimhood. He was not handcuffed to a hospital bed of trauma. What was his solace? How did he escape the seduction of his pain? Resting in and trusting the faithfulness of the Lord. He named his firstborn Manasseh. Look at the definition. God has made me forget. Was Joseph able to move past his trauma on his own? No, he was not. Did God see a counsel? Excuse me, did God... Did Joseph see a counselor for years and years to get well? No, he did not. His eyes were focused on what God was doing in his life. He knew God was bigger than his pain. Notice, notice that Joseph says that God made him forget, quote unquote, all my trouble and my father's household. Joseph didn't blow off or dismiss a story. He just believed that no one had more power in his life than God. Then he moved on from Manasseh. And he names his second kid Ephraim. Manasseh and Ephraim, great names. Dog names, kid names. I've met some people named Ephraim. I don't think I've ever met a Manasseh. But again, look at the definition of Ephraim. God has made me fruitful. Watch this. Watch this. God has made me fruitful. Watch this. In the land of my affliction. Everywhere that Joseph looked, everywhere that Joseph looked, he was reminded that he did not belong where he was. Everywhere he looked, he could not escape the visual evidence of the horrors that were done to him. Nevertheless, even in the land of his affliction, God can make him fruitful. Did he forget? Did Joseph forget his story? No. Did Joseph make himself fruitful? No. Did Joseph manufacture the strength to make his life meaningful? No. God, Joseph's Lord, made him fruitful fruitful pain trauma triggers are real people can do very real and serious and nasty damage 
to each other. Many of us need counselors to help us navigate what has been done. However, our trauma does not define us. It does not determine our story, and it should not be endlessly dissected. It shouldn't. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes about our adoption into the family of our father. Romans 8.15 says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Hey, come on now. In our adoption through Jesus, we have been made new. We encounter the power and love and faithfulness and restoration of the Creator. In restoration, we become His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance so that we would walk in them. As an adopted son or daughter, you have value and purpose that no one in this world can take from you. You have been raised and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. A good counselor will help you experience the Holy Spirit's comfort and the power of our Father's calling. Be careful. The pull to self-pity and victimhood is strong. Super, super tempting. Living on a hospital bed of trauma can be easily justified. But I say to you, my brother and my sister, the hospital bed is not the abundance of Jesus. You are made to declare your own Manasseh. You are made to declare your own Ephraim. Deliverance, the tortured middle is real. It's very heavily populated by brothers and sisters in Christ. You do not have to stay there in the name of Jesus. In the tortured middle, the hospital bed is a very real area that binds so many of our brothers and sisters as trauma and triggers becomes more and more and more prolific and people line up to keep you locked in that place. I'm telling you, as we allow the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to go first, as we allow the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to go first, deliverance from the hospital bed and into abundance, is one of the riches of life as we seek to learn how to live it in the overflow. Man, I hope this has been helpful to you. I know many of us have suffered incredible amount of pain and darkness. If it were not that God our Father has the power to reach down into the darkest depths, we would all be in a whole lot of trouble. Hope this has been helpful to you. If it has been, if you would please help us by passing it around to your friends and your neighbors and your brothers and sisters in Christ, that would be super helpful. Uh, And if you feel so moved, man, we would be gracious. We would be super excited to receive your financial support. You can give to the ministry, trexo.org backslash donate, trexo.org backslash donate. Every dollar you give helps us give, send out exponential impact, both to people and to organizations, building pipelines of effective disciple making so that all God's people can walk in the overflow of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll be back together again real soon. God bless.